You missed a spot over there. Oh, hi! You caught me doing some really hard work cleaning things up. Hey, speaking of dirty things, let's talk about The Boys, the comic book, and how the Amazon Prime TV show cleaned it up a bit. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. The Boys is an adaptation of a comic by the same name that recently debuted on Amazon Prime TV to rave reviews. It is a dark superhero show, although at times hilarious. Focuses on five people that know the true nature of superheroes, and that is that they are all morally corrupt celebrities that work for a corporation that has no ethical boundaries. And these five people mean to keep them in check and uh, stop them from going too far. Now, I did not originally plan on discussing this comic or show because personally, I wasn't a big fan. I do tend to like writer Garth Ennis, but he notoriously is not a fan of superheroes, and when he writes for them, he makes them look like buffoons. Uh, and The Boys is really no exception. I was not a fan of the comic because I felt like it was very mean-spirited and the characters really didn't grow a lot. I, that was just my personal take on it. But then I decided to try this new TV show, and I loved it. The reviews, in my opinion, are accurate. This is a great show. So, in my opinion, showrunner Eric Kripke found some really interesting ways to adjust the characters and give them room to grow, room to breathe. I think that it's a big improvement. So today, I want to talk about some of the comparisons and contrasts between The Boys, the comic book, and The Boys, the TV show, and how, in my opinion, the TV show actually improved on things. Oh, in a quick note, Note, I don't plan on spoiling anything from the comic that the show hasn't already covered, but there will be spoilers for everything that happens within the TV show's eight episodes and some of the comic books so that I can make direct comparisons. So, proceed to watch at your own peril. Beginning in late 2006, The Boys was written by Garth Ennis and co-created by artist Derek Robertson, who illustrated most of the run, which concluded in 2012. It ran for 72 issues plus three six-issue miniseries. Garth Ennis told the press that The Boys would out Preacher Preacher, his previous hit series known for its over-the-top violence. The Boys certainly succeeds on that level. In the world of The Boys, superheroes exist, and they are celebrities. The most popular group is known as The Seven, and it's a thinly veiled allegory for the Justice League of America, with analogs for their characters from Superman to The Flash. But in this comic, the heroes are managed and essentially owned by a powerful corporation known as Vought American, who we eventually realize created superheroes with the chemical Compound V. The comics, like the TV show, view everything through main character Huey Campbell, an ordinary, underachieving young man. His girlfriend is killed when super speedster A-Train runs right through her. Huey, in his grief and anger, is recruited by a man named Billy Butcher, who works off the books for the CIA to keep superheroes in check and punish them when they go too far. His team, the boys, also consists of Mother's Milk, the Frenchman, and the female. Now, the TV show follows very much the same setup. In the comics, the only member of the Seven that really gets much of a storyline is Homelander, the sociopathic version of Superman. Uh, the boys are really distracted from facing the Seven by going after a lot of other superheroes. They're, they're going after tech-based superheroes, a team team, uh, a team that's very much like the X-Men with all sorts of spin-offs that are related to them. The book is a commentary on the tropes of superhero comics. But uh, we do sometimes get a look at the inner workings of the Seven and Vought, but it's usually through the viewpoint of new recruit Starlight. She's an innocent girl from the Bible Belt, and she begins a relationship with Huey when they meet outside of their respective jobs. But the comics take a lot of time to have the boys beat up other superheroes before eventually dealing with the Seven. And so that central conflict is mostly backburnered for the comics, along with Huey's relationship with Starlight, 
whose real name is Annie. Let's get into some of the key differences between the comics and the TV show. First of all, in the comics, the boys all take Compound V so that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with superheroes. Butcher, after recruiting Huey, injects him with Compound V without warning. Consequently, Huey accidentally kills teen superhero Blarney Cock with a super-powered punch. In the TV show, the boys are ordinary people, which means that they're always the underdogs when they're going up against a superhero, with the exception of Kamiko, the female. They have to plan things out, strategize, and figure out a weakness to exploit. This creates a lot more tension, since they're outclassed, and it also gives Huey more agency, as he's actively deciding to join the boys, instead of essentially being forced into the team. Huey on the TV show is able to display a lot more ingenuity. Examples include his missions to infiltrate the Seven and superhero Popclaw's apartment, so that the boys can conduct surveillance. He also has more of an opportunity to be brave, like when he disobeys Butcher and allows himself to get caught by Vought mercenaries so that he can help the rest of the team escape. Those characteristics all help to make Huey more likable and relatable. Before the series is over, he's standing up to Billy Butcher, which takes him about six years worth of comics to get to that same point. Until then, his character is stagnant. Speaking of making Huey likable, the TV show also does a really great job at making some pretty horrible people at least understandable, if not relatable, and sends a lot of them on arcs of redemption, if not forgiveness. Uh, now, a lot of that does have to do with the antagonists in The Seven, but the show also takes some pretty clever steps on making Billy Butcher and the female more relatable. So let's talk about that real quick first. In the comics, Billy Butcher always struck me as some sort of entitled frat boy that just got sadistic pleasure by hurting others. Examples include him sabotaging the jetpack of a tech-based hero instead of simply turning him over to the authorities, since he was not an active threat, and his stabbing death of Jack from Jupiter, which lasts so long, Jack passes out, and when he comes to, Billy is still stabbing him. Butcher injects Huey and changes him without asking. And by the end of the comics, without giving away the storyline, he proves that he is not a friend to anyone on his own team. In the comics, he's motivated by the rape and death of his wife at the hands of Homelander. In the TV show, he has similar motivation and is single-minded in his pursuit, but not as heartless. His motivations, however, are ultimately revealed to have been based on a lie as the show ends with Billy learning his wife was neither raped nor killed. That twist really helps because now even the readers of the comics will get a variation on the story when the second season begins. In the comics, the female is mute and lethal, but her origin is that she accidentally ate Compound V from the corpses of super-powered beings. In the show, she's given an actual name, Kamiko, and we learn that she was a child soldier given Compound V by Vought-funded guerrilla fighters in a long-term plan to potentially create their own super-powered enemies. Since Vought is the only place that has superheroes to combat super-powered terrorists, this would give a boost to the Seven and manipulate the U.S. government into paying them to allow the Seven to serve in the military. In the comics, Vought is pretty much content to keep business as usual and just market the Seven into various media projects. The Vought Corporation in the TV show has an insidious long-term plan to manipulate people. One great change is to the character of Stillwell, a Vought executive in charge of the Seven. In the comics, he's James Stillwell and cares about nothing but Vought's profits and how the media sees the Seven. He's a sociopath, and honestly, kind of one note. But in the TV show, James becomes Madeline. Same responsibilities, but with a fascinatingly creepy dynamic with Homelander. She has an understandable fear for Homelander, but keeps him in check. Homelander clearly has feelings for Madeline, but he hates her baby and the fact that the baby takes attention away from him. Madeline is aware of her control over Homelander and uses it carefully in an attempt to control him. Homelander cannot be controlled because he's just too powerful and a bit more clever than Vought gives him credit for. 
In the comics, Homelander acted like a spoiled brat who always wanted to get his way, but on the show, even his team is afraid of him. We get to see him turn on his fake charm when the cameras are on and off when he's left to his own devices. He desperately wants to be taken more seriously. He wants to be needed. And to do that, he goes to horrific lengths to make himself appear useful. A great example of this is the episode where Homelander and Queen Maeve are dispatched by Vought to save a transatlantic flight from terrorists. If they save everyone, that could go a long way to convincing the government to allow them into the military. Instead, Homelander inadvertently destroys the controls when killing the terrorists, and he has no way to save the plane. So he abandons everyone on it and yells at the passengers that he'll burn them alive if they try to get too close to him. He refuses to save even a single child, as it would create bad press. Homelander later lies to the press and says he could have saved everyone if they simply worked with the military and got notified sooner. In the comics, a plane crashes the inciting incident that leads to the formation of the boys. We learn about midway through the comics run that the Seven tried to stop one of the planes on 9-11, but messed up and it crashed into the Brooklyn Bridge. Vought has used its resources to cover that up, but the CIA learned about it and authorized the boys to do their work. In the show, the boys have a contact with the CIA, but none of their resources. But besides fleshing out key characters like Huey and Billy Butcher, the show also takes time to flesh out the antagonists from The Seven, as well as certain people that work at Vought. And that ended up surprising me and being one of the elements that I liked the most about the TV show. Besides Homelander, the show focuses on A-Train, The Deep, and Starlight. In the comics, Starlight was forced to perform fellatio on Homelander, A-Train, and Black Noir. In the show, this is changed to just the Deep. So from the very beginning, we kind of hate the Deep. But he's not taken seriously by his team or Vought, and is eventually punished by having to protect a small city in the Midwest where his powers are useless. His often hilarious attempts to live up to being a hero are pathetic, and they end in the deaths of a horny dolphin and a supermarket lobster. But we end up feeling a bit bad for the Deep, as he's still trying to help them. He's later molested, and it seems to represent a turning point where he reinterprets his own actions. The character in the comics barely had any lines and was just a grumpy guy in a deep-sea diving suit. Similarly, A-Train screws up and kills Huey's girlfriend, but doesn't do much else in the comics. And in the comics, he's actually fighting a supervillain when he accidentally kills Huey's girlfriend. But on the show, he's given an arc about being addicted to V because he fears losing his spot on the team to another speedster. He was high and running to get more V when he kills Robin. This is much worse. And A-Train remains an egocentric jerk, but his addiction storyline gives him something we can understand. And his motivation to remain at the top is something comprehensible. His relationship with Popclaw is new for the show, and it's a dark reflection of Huey's relationship with Annie. Annie is far more proactive on the show. She doesn't learn about Huey being in the boys until years into the comics run. She figures things out much faster on the show. She also goes through an arc realizing that her dream of being on The Seven really isn't her dream, it was her mother's, and it doesn't come close to meeting her expectations she also finds herself challenging her religion. When Annie figures out that Huey lied to her when they were starting a relationship, it gives their relationship actual tension and stakes. The actors have great chemistry, and we want it to work, but can understand why it might not because of each character's responsibilities. Ultimately, I found myself really caring for the main characters, and I even had sympathy for most of the antagonists. That really shocked me. Homelander is ultimately completely detestable, but we sort of understand why he's that way. He was raised in a lab by scientists without any love, so it's understandable why he's so messed up, and he's still entertainingly evil. He isn't uh, annoying. He isn't boring. Now, that would be a cardinal sin. Now, when it comes to superheroes, 
I don't care for Garth Ennis's take. I like Garth Ennis's writing on stuff like Constantine and Preacher. He's done a lot of great comics. I like his dialogue. I like his plotting, and his plotting in The Boys is good. But I just have trouble getting over how buffoonish he makes them. I feel that he often writes superheroes a little out of character. For instance, he wrote a Punisher story where Spider-Man, Daredevil, and Wolverine all decided that it was time to take down the Punisher. But in that comic that he wrote, they were all fools. They were all buffoons that were easily outclassed by the Punisher. I think that that's out of character. And I think that that disdain does some disservice to his work on The Boys. Some of it is just trying to be shocking and mean-spirited just for the just for the sake of getting a rise out of the audience. Now, you might feel something, and it's, some of it is funny, but some of it is just depressing, in my opinion. That's just my take. You may love the comics. I do think that the TV show, ultimately, is an improvement. I prefer how they give all of the characters more room to grow, and they find some clever world building. All of the Seven and the boys are tied together uh, within Vought's you know, orbit. Uh, Vought is making the big changes and everybody else is reacting to them. It's a very tight-knit story. So, ultimately, I preferred that take. Another thing I like, fan art! Let's take a look at what came in this week. Bobby Wonder rendered me as a Liefeld character from the 90s. I think I look good. You can see more of Bobby's work on Instagram and Vimeo. Reverend Worm envisions me cosplaying as the unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Check out more of his work on Instagram. Maxwell, also known as Ear Go Ma, illustrated me yelling about comics. That's me at work every 10 minutes. Matt Williams has a different take on me being illustrated in a Liefeld style. You can see more of Matt's work on DeviantArt. Jonathan Scott sent in this dynamic piece featuring me as Shazam. Jonathan has more work on Instagram and his website. Simon Pizaram illustrated me as a buff superhero. Simon, you got my neck muscles right, but I actually do have functioning hands these days as well. Alvaro Jimenez helps us all see what I'll look like on my deathbed in a few weeks. Cannonball has been a new mutant, an X-Man, and an Avenger, but now he's me. Thanks for the artwork, Grimlock. Finally, Gennaro from Mexico, also known as Sad Pop-Tart, made this artwork where I'm an elder omnipotent being. In other words, it's an accurate portrait. Gennaro asked me to give a shout out to his local comic shop, Adam Comics. All right, nine awesome pieces. Thank you very much. If you would like to have fan art featured on this show, I'm happy to feature it as long as it has something to do with Comic Tropes itself. So just send that to comictropes at gmail.com happy to feature it, and then I enter everybody that submitted something in a chance to win a Gachapon prize. Now, normally when you watch this show, I have my Gachapon machine right here on a stand. I have recently moved, the stand broke, and I'm actually still missing certain elements of what I use for my set. For instance, uh, I recently got a ball spinner so that I could pick the winner out of that. I still need to find where I uh, boxed up all those little ping pong numbered balls. So I'm going back to the old-fashioned way. I have nine uh, entrants uh, listed on numbers. I'm just dropping it in an ordinary plastic bag, shaking it up to see who wins. And we're getting number, number two. Number two, I believe that was Reverend Worm. So Reverend Worm, you want a gachapon. I don't have the stand, but I do still have my gachapon machine. Ugh! Some people were concerned that it was broken. Well, that was uh, just light reflecting on it weird. Uh, it is fine. It is working just fine. Let's see what you won. This is a Hellboy figurine. It looks like it might be Rasputin, I think. So uh, that's pretty cool. Congratulations, Reverend Worm. And hopefully next week I'm able to have my full studio set up again. Uh, I'll do my best. Let's see, uh, what haven't I mentioned about the TV show and the comic The Boys? I do think that the idea of superheroes that are fallible is definitely worth exploring. Uh, previously, I did a review for the comic book Brat Pack, and I feel that it covered a lot of the same ideas that The Boys did. Uh, so it was done first. As to whether it was done better, well, that's going to be up to you. Um, I think that The Boys is definitely a TV show worth watching. As far as the comic, 
just not a fan. Um, I usually do like Garth Ennis. Derek Robertson, I think, was an appropriate artist for this book. Derek Robertson has a very uh, heavy, thick, scratchy line to his artwork, and I feel that that does help bring some grittiness and some groundedness to the characters. I think he has nice, dark lines which suit the tone of the comic. So he was a good choice. Uh, I think that the idea was good. Just personally, not a huge fan of the comic book execution, which is why I was pleasantly surprised at the TV show adaptation. So even if you haven't read the comics, personally, I don't think you need to. I would just say, if you're curious, check out this show. It's really cool. It has lots of twists and turns. I like the main characters. I like Huey. I like Annie January, AKA Starlight. They're awesome. I want them to succeed and they're huge underdogs all the time. Anyway, that's about all I have to say this week. I really appreciate that you all uh, stuck around this far. Um, oh, I should mention that the prizes from the Gachapon machine come from Lunar Shines, because Lunar Shines donated the Gachapon machine. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, also, uh, any help you want to donate to the show is always appreciated. I've got, you know, a Patreon. I've got a coffee account where you can do a one-time tip. Otherwise, just hitting like and subscribe, leaving a comment, that all really helps. That helps with the YouTube algorithm if you subscribe. So I really appreciate that. I think that there's a great chance that this channel will cross 100,000 subscribers before the end of the year. And that's all on you. So I really appreciate that kind of support. Like we're, we're getting closer every single day. It's, it's always growing. It's never just plateauing. It's never going down. I love seeing that. So all I can say is I'm going to keep working hard to produce a video every week. I've got some cool stuff coming up, some, some things that people have requested a lot. You guys all requested the boys a lot. So I was like, fine, I'm going to bump the uh, projects that I had in the works one week. I'm going to fit in the boys. Uh, I've done so. Uh, so I am now in my new home. This may look very similar, but it's a completely new studio. Hopefully, over time, I'm going to be able to improve the lighting and the audio. I've already worked on, like, um, soundproofing this. So hopefully, the audio is at least a little bit better than it's been in the past, a little less echoey. Um, I've got some brand new lights that I got recently that I'll be setting up all around the room to try to even everything out. Hopefully, it all works. Anyway, thank you so much for sticking with me, and until I see you next time, Keep reading comics.